If you will, go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, and my intent to, tonight is to uh, not go long, although I've said that before. This is a passage that we're actually, I think, all very familiar with. I, I know that I've mentioned the passage numerous times in other sermons, but as I begin to think about this passage, I don't believe I've ever actually preached a sermon on it. And so I thought what we would do is spend a little bit of time just looking at a couple of passages here, Matthew 7, 21 through 23. If you will follow along with me. Our Lord and Savior, as He's teaching, says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. And many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out demons, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I would go so far as to say probably the majority of us are familiar with this passage. Uh, it comes at the very end of our Lord teaching the Sermon on the Mount here, uh, which starts in Matthew chapter 5 and ends in chapter 7. And although I think it is very familiar to us, you know, oftentimes I think we as Christians, we read passages and sometimes we, we simply skip over the basic concepts of a passage. And so I hope tonight we can, we can simply spend a few minutes trying to grasp the true and the deep significance and the practical application here in this passage. <clears throat> As I very quickly in a few points look at this passage, uh, again, I want you to understand that this passage, and it's interesting, really sums up, I think, in many ways, the entire New Testament teaching. Let's notice a basic concept right from the very beginning here in verse 21. One of the things we learned right off the bat in this passage is, is there is a place called heaven. You wouldn't think that we would have to actually make a statement like that. He, he uses the term here, the kingdom of heaven. In, in this passage here, he's actually referring to our eternal kingdom, heaven, as we can tell from the context. Sometimes you'll see the term kingdom of heaven. And it can refer either to heaven or it could even refer to the church as we see in Matthew 3, 2 and also Matthew 4, 17. But here in context, he is talking about our, our final reward. And so as we look at this passage, we understand very quickly heaven is, is not a myth. It's not a made up place. It's not a state of mind. This is a real place that is intended for faithful followers of God. It's also the place where the Father is. It is the place where Jesus has now gone. And we know that from a number of verses. Let me give you just one. 1 Peter 3, 22. Who has gone into heaven, talking of Jesus, and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto Him. And I mentioned a little bit this morning as I, as I read about this place. It is a place that is described as a place of beauty. Revelation 21, 18. It is a place where there will be no sorrows and there's no weeping. Revelation 21, 4. It is, not a, it is not a place that is temporary like the earth. Now I know that oftentimes, and I'll be honest, I even struggle with this. Sometimes it is hard to imagine something that will endure and last forever. The idea of eternity, the idea of maybe you would call it infinity, or the fact that it will never, ever, ever come to an end. That's where the faithful followers of God will be. We'll notice at the end of this sermon there is the opposite location. But heaven is a place that will last forever. It's not like the earth which will one day be destroyed by fire. Now again, I know there are those that, <clears throat> that teach a number of unusual things about the end, the end of this world and, and when the judgment day comes. But we know from 2 Peter 3.10 that's exactly what will happen. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. And so heaven is the place where when we, when we die, we, are, we will dwell there after our bodies have been changed into a new form. It's part of the reason we live the way that we do. Uh, I talked about that this morning. We live the way that we live as Christians because we want to go to this place that we see described as a beautiful, wonderful place. Now, listen to Philippians 3, 19 through 20. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is 
in their shame, whose mind earthly things. This is the reason I chose this passage. Listen to the next verse. For our conversation, our manner of life, is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. What he was saying was, is the reason we live the way that we live is because we want to go to this place that we call heaven. Now, when we die, and I've talked about it a couple of times, we understand that our, our corruptible bodies, they will put on incorruption. And I know that it's somewhat hard to understand as to how this process takes place. But I think 1 Corinthians 15, 52, and 53 probably gives us the best uh, idea and description. Notice what Paul tells the Corinthian church. 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. The idea of, of our bodies or the elements that are left being changed into whatever it is uh, can inherit this kingdom in heaven is not something that I think we, we as man can fully grasp. Yet we are told this, it's going to happen in the King James, it's worded in the twinkling of an eye. Instantaneous, the bodies will be changed into this form that can, that can inherit the kingdom of, of heaven, this uh, final resting place. Someday when our bodies no longer exist, and that day will come, whether it comes uh, after, after we've died and our bodies are buried in the ground, or whether it comes while we're still alive, someday when our bodies no longer exist, we will have a building from God. Paul describes this in 2 Corinthians 5.1. He says, For we know that if our, earth, if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Again, it's the idea that this world is only, only going to be in existence for a short time. It's only our temporary dwelling place, but there resides a place that we call heaven. Now, I know that many, as they look here at the passage, Matthew 7, 21 and 23, they oftentimes will just skip over a basic concept such as that. But we know that there is a place called heaven. We also know in verse 21, only those who do the will of the Father are going to enter into this place we call heaven. Some think that the grace of God and, and the idea of works or, or being faithful to God's Word, some think that those are incompatible. As a matter of fact, we saw a little hint of that. Uh, earlier today as, as we were studying. Uh, but on the contrary, what we understand is that salvation is both by grace and by works. I want you to think about it a little bit differently. And let me tell you right off the bat, I don't have an uncle like this, but, but imagine I were to have an uncle who would, who would tell me, you know, Sean, when you uh, graduate from college and when you finish your education and and get married, and when you have a child, if you'll name that child after me, I will give you a million dollars. If I carried every one of those things out, and indeed this uncle gave me a million dollars, did I earn that or was it still a gift? All I simply did was meet the requirements, right? It was a gift, and so it is when you begin to think about grace. Listen to Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through the faith. If you're following along in a different translation than me and you don't mind writing in your Bible, that word is usually left out of most translations. That word, the, in Ephesians 2.8, you should add that. That isn't the original language in the Greek, and it does change the meaning. For by grace are you saved through the faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should, ba should boast. Most people today, when they talk about being saved through faith, they, they teach this idea of faith alone. I want you to understand Ephesians 2.8 in the correct form is extremely important for us to understand and, and to render it that way. We are saved through the faith. We are saved through the system of faith. We are saved through the gospel system. We are saved through the entirety of the New Testament. And with that being said, there are certain things that we as Christians, followers of God, must do. And so, we are saved by grace through faith, but I want you to understand this. Most people stop there. I want you to go to the very next verse, Ephesians 2.10. It shows, it shows what's included in this. Listen, for we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained 
that we should walk in them. What's the idea? We are saved by grace, but we are saved by grace and we are expected to have an active faith. Matter of fact, in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, Paul is showing the purpose and the plan of God in Christ. We, we understand we cannot be saved by our own methods. We can't choose the way that we want to be saved. I hear a phone ringing, so I hope it's not God calling. For anybody watching this, I'm just kidding. That's not, I don't want that to be seen on YouTube. God. We understand we can't save ourselves. Uh, we can't devise our own methods. And why do I bring that up? Because there are religious groups out there today who have tried to devise their own methods of salvation. They've tried to come up with their own ways of earning righteousness in God. Man can't do that. And so we understand, as the religious world around us often teaches this idea of faith-only salvation, I want you to recall that uh, the only times you're ever going to find the word faith and alone ever taught together in the Scriptures would be James 2.24. You see then how that by works a man is justified, notice here, and not by faith only. Now I assure you, you'll use that verse in the, in the passage. And so as we look here in our text, Matthew 7, 21, what we understand is this. Uh, one must not only believe, but one has to do the will of the Father. The will of the Father, again, is summed up for those who are either following along on, on the Internet or for those that may not be familiar here. Just go to your New Testament and get to that blank page, right? You get to the blank page and you hold it up, and that is, that is the New Testament. That is the word that we live by. That is the will of the Father under the covenant in effect today. Now, with all that being said, we understand this. A person needs to actually be doing the will of the Father in order to go to heaven. Why do I bring that up? Because if you look in verse 23, it's extremely obvious from the verse here. Not everybody who considers himself to be religious, is actually doing the will of the Father. Right? Our, our, our Father in heaven simply did not want us to go through this life confused, and we know that He is not the author of, of confusion. He's made His will known to us. Paul describes it this way to the Ephesian church. I'm going to read to you Ephesians 1, 7-9. "...in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace, wherein He hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which He hath purposed in Himself. What He's showing us there is that the Lord has revealed His will for us today. We know that it's through the Word of God. Uh, we have all things that pertain unto life and godliness. He made this will known today through His Son. Listen to Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son, whom He hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also He made the worlds. You know, in the Old Testament, you go back and we understand that in many parts, in many different ways, His will was made known to those who were the patriarchs and those who lived under the law of Moses. However, for us today, he made this will known specifically through His Son. We know that he, he taught for about three years, and then He appointed those who would be His ambassadors. Okay, Listen to Hebrews 2, 3, and 4. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard Him? God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles, and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to His own will. And so we understand that we first began to hear about this plan of redemption and the understanding of the New Testament uh, from our Lord and Savior, after it had been preached in the Old Testament through the prophets. And then as our Lord and Savior left, He then passed on this mission to the apostles, these ambassadors whom He gave authority, and they left us our Holy Scriptures. And so we have the inspired word from our Lord and Savior and from those who followed Him. And so we have the responsibility to learn the Father's will. We have His responsibility to learn what's been recorded for us. You know, why do I bring all that up? I, I think in the religious world today, there are many who don't place an emphasis on the Word of God. And because they don't, they, they don't really know whose will they are doing. In some cases, they're simply living according to their own will. They have no desire to follow the Scriptures. Matthew 7, 15 and John, 1 John 4, 1, 
show us that there are many false teachers who have gone out into the world and that we as Christians, we need to test them and we need to identify them. I know, again, that that's not something that people today like to hear. Uh, but I assure you that every single person who teaches the gospel should have that mindset. That every single thing that is taught in a religious way, we ought to look up and verify that what it is that they're teaching us is in alignment with the Scriptures. And the reason is, is because we want to do the Father's will. And so we need to know what that will is. In today's religious world, there are many who do not believe that there is any, any such thing as a standard of morality because they don't believe that there's, there's no such thing as false teaching. And so there are many who would simply not know whether they're being taught the truth or not being, being taught the truth. And for those, it is very difficult for them to have an understanding of what the Lord's will is. That's going to be extremely important. It's going to be important when... The judgment day comes. Now, in, in this text here, he uses the expression in verse 22, that day. He's talking about a very specific day. He's talking about the day in which there will be a judgment. It is the judgment for all men of all ages, of all races, of all nationalities. In essence, every single person, whether a believer or not a believer, they will stand before and they will be judged. Listen to Revelation 20:11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. I won't spend much time on the standard of judgment. We talked about it a little bit this morning, John 12, 48, and the idea of that word um, kane, or the word we take for our, our word canon, talking about rule or law. And we understand that there is a standard of judgment, but we notice there is a judgment scene. It's certainly seen in this phrase here as he talks about that day. But let me read you from Revelation 20, verse 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. Certainly there will be a judgment day. We know that there is a place called heaven. We now know who will go to heaven. It is those who do the will of the Father. And we also understand that there will be a judgment scene before this takes place. We know that the judge is going to be Jesus Christ himself. If you will, turn to Acts 17, 30 and 31. Acts 17, 30 and 31. I'm going to make just a couple of points from this, from this uh, passage here. But I want you to follow along with me. And I want you to understand just a couple of basics. Acts 17, starting in verse 30. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. I write in my Bible here, why? Notice the answer. Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. Here are the basics for the judgment scene, for those who are confused what's going to take place. The time for the judgment has already been set. Verse 31, we understand he has appointed a day. What day that is, I don't know. No man knows. As a matter of fact, he'll come back as a thief in the night. I know we've all seen the signs on the highway that say God's coming back. Jesus is coming back soon. Uh, or, or we've even had those who've tried to set dates. We don't know when he's coming back. The thief doesn't tell you when he's going to come back, right? When he's going to break into the house. So we don't know when he's coming back. But we do know a date has been set. It's that day. We know that the manner in which he will judge us has been set. Notice again verse 31. He's going to judge the world in righteousness. Inherent in the idea of righteousness is again the idea that there is a standard that one must meet. We also understand that the judge has already been assigned in verse 31. He will judge the world by the man whom he has ordained. And so we know who we're going to stand in front of. We also see the assurance of the judgment has been clearly established. And he's given this assurance by raising him from the dead. Again, verse 31. The one who would shed his blood, the one who would, who would die by hanging on that cross, the one who who would then be seen to resurrect, to overcome death, 
and to raise to the right hand of the Father. Well, there's a lot of things we understand from this passage. There's something else that is implied. We see the word depart here. Some are going to go to heaven. Others are going to be told, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And so you begin to think about the idea of departing, and, and you must ask yourself, where is it that the Scriptures declare they will depart to? Certainly, we know there's a place called heaven. He starts off talking about that. But now we understand there's also a place where those who do not do the will of the Father will go to. So what does the Bible talk about regarding that place? What we understand is, is the wicked is going to be severed from God. Listen to Matthew 13, 40-42. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire. I want you to stop for a second. Remember, we talked about the earth being burned. He goes on here and he says, So shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth His angels, and they shall gather out of His kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire, and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. We start off with a passage that, that certainly is a place that nobody would want to go, right? Uh, certainly we don't want to depart to a place like this, but the Scriptures has, have much more to say about this place. There are a lot of vivid, I think scary descriptions of this place where those who do not do the will of the Father will depart. It's actually described as a furnace of fire. Listen to Matthew 13, 42, which we just ended with, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire, and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. It's not just that it's a furnace of fire, we actually understand that it is an unquenchable fire. It's described this way in Mark 9, 43 through 46. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It's better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It's better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Now, I have to always say, he's not literally telling them to, to cut off their hands or their feet. I, I've heard of actually people doing things like that. His point was to cast away that which causes you to sin. But the place that he describes for those who sin, the ones who don't do the, the, the will of the Father, it's a horrible place. As a matter of fact, it's described as a place of everlasting punishment. Matthew 25, 46, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but notice the contrary, but the righteous into life eternal. And so it's a place of outer darkness where there's going to be, as we said, weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's eternal destruction. It is a place uh, in which we will be separated from the Lord forever, 2 Thessalonians 1, 6-9. And so as we think about the two destinations for those based on the Father's will, one will go to a place that is so, so wonderful, the words can't simply describe how magnificent it is. And yet there are those on the opposite side who did not do the Father's will. And they go to a place that is so bad that no matter how hard I try, I can't even describe how bad it is. And so there are many reasons uh, that there are those who will not be approved or recognized in that day. I want you to go back and notice in verse 23... He's, he tells them to depart from him because they worked iniquity. Again, in the English language, this really doesn't transfer the entire meaning of the word. In the original Greek, this word iniquity is actually the word here, is the word law, but it's prefaced by the negative. What I mean is it's not law. They are without law. They are lawlessness. And so when he says here they worked iniquity, what he is saying is, is you worked apart from the law. You weren't in alignment with the law. It goes along with the sermon this morning when I talked about that, that, that measuring read, how it, it is the standard of, of which we are, we are judged. Here you see the word here that they are without law. The same words actually used in 2 Thessalonians 2.7. It's used to describe a great apostasy. Notice how it's used here. For the mystery of iniquity, or those who do not work law, doth already work 
Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. When we see that word iniquity, what we need to understand is, is it covers anybody who is not living according to the law of Christ, according to the perfect law of liberty. It doesn't matter how small it is, and it doesn't matter how big it is. Iniquity, or apart from the law, is iniquity. Okay? And those people that are in that situation are the ones that will be told, depart from me. But I want you to notice a few things that we notice here in verse 22, as I begin to draw this to a close. I want you to notice their questions. You go back and you look at, at the way that starts off, and they said, but Lord, didn't we? And as you look at their questions, this is what we can infer. And there are verses to support it. Just because somebody's religious doesn't mean that they were saved. These people here, they were very religious. Just because somebody is sincere doesn't mean that they are right. These people in this passage here were very sincere in what they were doing. They were saying they, they cast out demons and they did works. And Just because somebody feels or thinks that they're in a righteous relationship with God doesn't mean that they are. These people, they thought that they were saved. Just because somebody's active or just because somebody's doing uh, religious works, again, doesn't mean that they're in a righteous relationship with the Father. Just because they have a show of success. And why would I bring that up? I'll be honest, the religious world around us, and, and as you guys know, I drive by a, a large congregation every day. But they don't teach the truth. And it's funny how skewed it is because my wife even said to me today as we drove by, I'd much rather have 50 faithful people at worship than a whole building full of people that are unfaithful and don't know the truth. And that's exactly right. Uh, sometimes I think she helps keep me balanced. The world around us can make it appear that we're not successful in the Lord's church because we are small. But I'm going to be honest, when you go back and you look at Matthew 7, 21 through 23, we find out we're actually a very successful group. You know why? Because we are in alignment with the Father's will, and we're not going to be told, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And so when you begin to think about all that's said here in this passage, and, and really we could talk about this passage for probably another hour and not cover all the things that are covered in this passage, but here's what we understand. There is a forcefulness seen in this passage because he is talking about a judgment scene. He's talking about what's going to happen to all men based on whether they are in accordance with God's Word or whether they are not in accordance with with God's Word. We understand that there is a place called heaven and there is a place called hell. One is so wonderful it can never be described. The other is so bad it can never be described. The location for all men and where they will go is based on whether or not they understand and abide by the Father's will. So certainly as we look at this passage, it really ought to make us consider every single thing that we do in life. Are we in alignment with the Father's will? Certainly that all begins with being added to the church, Acts 2.47. We know that the church was established on the day of Pentecost, there in Acts chapter 2, after Peter preached. Those who obeyed the gospel were added to the church itself by the Lord Himself. And so for anyone to be doing the will of the Father, that must start by becoming a Christian. If you're here today, uh, we ask whether or not you have obeyed the gospel. Has somebody taught you the gospel and that Jesus Christ was the Messiah? Did you believe it? Hebrews 11.6. Were you willing to repent of your sins? Luke 13.3. And confess the name of Christ. Romans 10.9 and 10. And did you get baptized by immersion, just as Jesus commanded in Mark 16.16. 16. If you've not done that, please don't leave without talking to me. If you are here and you are a believer, ask yourself very simply this. Am I doing the will of the Father? That's actually a pretty big question. I would urge you to go back and to begin to study the Word of God and try to look for those areas where you might fall short. If you're here and you know that you have fallen short of God's standard, 1 John 1, 7-9, repent of it, turn from it, and just be faithful. And the Scriptures show us that will not be held against us. If you're here and there's a way that we can help you as a congregation, if we could pray for you, if there is another need, you can simply come forward as we stand and sing a song of invitation.